This is jam-packed Kizar Stadium in San Francisco, where on January 3rd, the 49ers met the Cowboys in the NFC Championship. This game has been a long time coming for the citizens of the Golden Gate, for this is the first NFL championship in the 25-year history of the team. The 49ers had just completed their greatest season with a resounding thrashing of the feared Minnesota Vikings, and their fans flocked to this final game at ancient Kizar. The weather was representative of the best California can offer, and 59,800 feverish spectators paid tribute to the excitement and success that were the San Francisco 49ers of 1970. The Californians had a lot to cheer about, for their team was one of the big surprises in the world of sport. San Francisco was the sudden, unexpected successor to such Western powers as the Vikings, Rams, and Packers. Dick Nolan, who today coached against his old mentor, Tom Landry, has brought some new faces to San Francisco. One is number 44, Rookie of the Year candidate Bruce Taylor, who has all pro potential at cornerback. Another is number 25, 10-year veteran Roosevelt Taylor, who has provided leadership. But old faces are important, too, and none more so than the NFC Player of the Year, John Brody. The 35-year-old quarterback had a brilliant season. One of the reasons for his success was the 49er offensive line. They led the entire NFL in protecting their passer. Brody was dumped only eight times all year. This was a new NFL record. While the 49ers seem to be a complete team, their opponents, the Dallas Cowboys, have earned entry to their third championship game despite a definite lack of passing. It's been a great running attack and an amazing defense that has won for Dallas. Opponents have been held without a touchdown for 21 consecutive quarters. Tom Landry, the only coach Dallas has had in its 11-year history, knows that to win today, the defense must sustain a super effort and rely on an undisguised running attack for points on offense. So that was the situation in old Kizar Stadium, which in past years had been better known as a home for seagulls than championship football teams. But on its field today was the last act before the Super Bowl number five, a tournament to decide in 60 minutes what has taken more than 15 weeks to accomplish. I'm Pat Summerall, and this is the NFL Game of the Week, the Dallas Cowboys versus the San Francisco 49ers in the NFC Championship. The entire first half belonged to the defenses of both teams. Though Dallas ran well, they were stopped in every key situation. The 49er defense that was stopping them was a familiar one. Dick Nolan was Tom Landry's defensive assistant at Dallas before coming to the West Coast. So there is a generic sameness about both defensive squads. Dallas has its doomsday defense and the 49ers have their gold rushers led by number 70, 12 year veteran Charlie Kruger. Besides Kruger, there are seven other gold rushers and all have seen considerable duty. San Francisco is unique in alternating so many players on its line, but the results have been superb, especially against the pass. Craig Morton was hurried and hammered each time he attempted to throw. In the first half, he completed only three passes for a lowly 29 yards. On one of the few times Morton wasn't pressured by the San Francisco front four, he missed a golden opportunity. Reserve defensive back Johnny Fuller was in the game for one play and was badly beaten by Bob Hayes, but Morton overthrew him. It wasn't all Morton's fault, however. Several times he threw perfectly to his receivers, but they betrayed him. The most damaging was a first quarter pass over the middle to Reggie Rucker, who had clear sailing ahead. But luckily for the Dallas offense, their defense was holding San Francisco to very little yardage. The 49ers weren't expected to run on the Cowboys, and they didn't. But John Brody was expected to throw against Dallas, and he couldn't. The Cowboys secondary was all over Brody's receivers. On the few occasions that they got open, he failed to hit them. 
One example of this came late in the second quarter when all-pro Gene Washington got behind Mel Renfro and just barely missed connections. With Washington's speed, a completion here would have meant a certain score, either a touchdown or a field goal, since he was deep in Dallas territory. Another look at this key play shows a blitz by number 54, Chuck Howley, caused Brody to unload quickly. Dallas used the blitz to perfection today, employing the speedy Howley or safety Cornell Green on the tactic. Like his counterpart on the Cowboys, the 49er quarterback disappointed with his inaccuracy during the first half and failed to hit his receivers the few times they got open. Only once did Brody put it all together. On the second series of the first quarter, he passed to Ken Willard on a swing. The 49er fullback followed number 79, tackled Cass Vanazak for 12 yards and the first first down of the game for San Francisco. Then with first and 10 on his 48, Brody went for the bomb and got it. Gene Washington caught the ball on the 15 and fell forward to the 10. The play covered 42 yards. A repeat of this play from the ground level shows Washington, number 18, simply streaked by his defender, number 26, Herb Adderley, and was a good four steps in front of him when he caught the ball. Washington, with his speed, should have scored. Another look at the play reveals why he didn't. Brody was rushed by number 74, Bob Lilly. Washington had to hold up slightly for the ball and had to look back from the shadows into the sun. This may have been the most critical play of the entire game because the 49ers couldn't get in for the touchdown. Ken Willard was smashed to the ground by Lilly and Jethro Pugh and on third down, number 34, Cornell Green blitzed Brody, causing his pass to fall incomplete. Willard was the intended receiver, and he had an angle on linebacker Dave Edwards. It was Brody's strategy to isolate Willard on the slower Edwards rather than the right linebacker Chuck Howley, who is faster. Bruce Gossett's chip shot field goal was good, and San Francisco led 3-0. But a golden opportunity had been missed. On the very next series, Dallas began to move for the first time, and there was nothing deceptive about the way they did it. They ran right at the 49er defense and succeeded. The Cowboy offensive line cleared huge gaping holes for Dwayne Thomas and number 42, Claxton Welch. It was a vivid example of how the Dallas offense has been transformed from one that depended upon finesse to an attack that simply outmuscles the opposition. Landry has admitted his team is, for the first time, a physically strong team. Despite the display of power, the San Francisco defense again made the big play when they needed it most. On third down, Morton's sideline pass to Hayes was broken up by Mel Phillips. A repeat shows that Phillips was beaten but made a diving save. If he had missed, the speedy Hayes might have gone the distance. Mike Clark tried a field goal from the 40-yard line, but it was short. San Francisco held on to their slim three-point lead. Late in the second quarter, however, Dallas began another long drive. Number 32, Walt Garrison, had returned to the lineup, and his blocking cleared the way for Dwayne Thomas, the sensational rookie from West Texas State. Some people think the Cowboys used psychology to pick Thomas number one because of their low order in the draft. Many clubs passed him up despite his obvious ability because reports that he was moody and unresponsive had filtered out of Texas. Someone was wrong somewhere, for all Thomas had done in his first season was to put Calvin Hill on the bench and rank fifth in the conference in running. And he didn't start until the fifth game of the season. Despite Thomas' heroics, 
A third down look-in pass to Mike Ditka was stopped short by number 25, Rosie Taylor. Dallas was forced to go for the field goal instead of the touchdown. This time, Mike Clark was accurate, and Dallas had finally scored. So the first half, a half which saw two very hot defenses and two very cold quarterbacks, ended with a 3-3 stalemate. With the game tied 3-3, Coach Nolan and the 49ers came out for the second half determined to contain Dallas' strength. But Dallas, surprisingly, came out passing to open the half. Their strategy was clever, but the play failed. On a repeat, watch Morton fake to Dwayne Thomas, hoping to suck in the 49er defenders. Although Bruce Taylor, number 44, was fooled for a second, Rosie Taylor was not, and the 49ers' free safety made a perfectly timed tackle on Morton's intended receiver, Bob Hayes. Tom Landry called for another pass on third down, but this too failed as Charlie Kruger got to Morton with a back-snapping tackle. A quick whistle saved an apparent fumble, but Dallas had to punt anyway. One of the keys of the game was the ability of the Cowboys' bomb squad to prevent long punt returns by Bruce Taylor, and they did so here. Then came what Tom Landry deemed to be the key series of the game. Brody was first dropped by blitzing Dave Edwards on first down to set up a second and 17, forcing Brody into another passing situation. Pressured heavily by Larry Cole, his pass went for Willard in the middle, but linebacker Leroy Jordan had his area perfectly covered, timed it beautifully, and intercepted the ball. Later, Brody said he was actually trying to throw away the pass. From here, it took Morton's offense one play to go into the lead. Dwayne Thomas started right, cut left, broke a few tackles, and went into the end zone. On a repeat, watch the Cowboys' right guard, number 61, Blaine Nye, screen his man out, opening a hole for Thomas to cut back through, as the Cowboys' offensive line was truly superb and deserves much of the credit for Dallas' fantastic comeback this season. Repeating the score from yet another angle, watch number 57, Frank Nunley, follow the flow of the play to his left, then be fooled by Thomas' quick cutback against the grain. Thomas then broke attempted tackles by number 52, linebacker Skip Vanderbunt, and number 37, Jimmy Johnson, on his way to the biggest touchdown in his short career, a touchdown that gave Dallas a 10-3 lead. Brody tried to lead his team downfield, again going up top almost exclusively. But he went to the well once too often and got stung. First faking to his back, he went for Gene Washington long. But all pro Mel Renfro was right with Washington and made a brilliant leaping interception to stop another frustrating 49er series. On a repeat of this key play, Brody's fake was a good one. But Renfro is perhaps the best man-for-man -man cornerback in football, and he was not fooled. Renfro, Green, Adderley, and Waters. Three all-pros and a rookie make up this secondary that had denied Brody the bomb and set up the Cowboys' offense again. This time, Coach Landry called on Walt Garrison to handle his ground game. Garrison had been all but forgotten in the urgency to stop Dwayne Thomas, and Landry's use of Garrison was truly brilliant. Every time the 49ers keyed on Thomas, 
Landry would call for a draw or a screen to Garrison, and the steady five-year man from Oklahoma State came through with flying colors. A repeat of this play will show Garrison's flawless execution. Watch Garrison on your left as he screen blocks the blitzing linebacker, then drifts into his area, takes the pass and rambles 23 yards into 49er territory. From here, the Cowboys got a big break when Mel Phillips was called for pass interference at the 49er five. Then it was Garrison again, this time swinging out of the backfield uncovered as one of Morton's infrequent passes hit Garrison for the score. On a repeat, watch Morton's fake to Thomas completely fool the 49er defense who were so anxious to stop Thomas, they over-pursued the play, leaving Garrison wide open. Coach Landry was calling the best game of the seven he had called this year, and the Cowboys were executing his plays like a machine. Cowboys 17, 49ers 3. Ahead by two touchdowns, the Cowboys' defense was in deep zone coverage now, giving Brody the short stuff over the middle. Brody took it. The drive was interrupted when Ken Willard was blinded by the sun and dropped a sure long gainer. But Brody cleverly called for a pass into the sun again, and tight end Bob Windsor held on and went to the Cowboys 26. Two plays later, Brody sent Dick Witcher deep and hit him for a touchdown. On a repeat, watch number 75, Jethro Pugh, as he was taken out by Woody Peoples. Brody then had to clear Bob Lilly's outstretched arms and did. Witcher, who had run a post-corner pattern, beating Herb Adderley was all alone when the ball arrived. In a sudden spurt of success, John Brody had the 49ers right back in the game, 17-10, as Dallas had given up its first touchdown in 24 quarters. The next Dallas drive was perhaps the most frustrating of them all for the 49ers, even though it would not end in a score. First, Dwayne Thomas fumbled, popped right into the hands of teammate Reggie Rucker for a first down. Then Thomas' deceptive speed became apparent to everyone, especially to number 44, Bruce Taylor, as Thomas beat him around the end for another first down. This streak was interrupted for one play when a Morton to Garrison pass for 36 yards deep into 49er territory was called back due to a clipping penalty as the third quarter ended. But then the 49er streak of bad luck continued to bloom. Mel Phillips played a Morton to Hayes bomb perfectly, but dropped it. Then Thomas on third and four again fumbled after getting the first, but again the Cowboys recovered. Three times the 49ers had a 50-50 shot at the ball on this drive, and three times they lost. However, all was not lost as Thomas was stopped short of a first on third and three from the 16, forcing a field goal attempt from the 24 by Mike Clark. Clark missed, and San Francisco had the ball with 11 minutes to play. Brody stuck to his short passing game to try and tie the score, and he started by hitting Witcher. 
On an isolated replay, we can see that unlike the first half, Brody had all the time he needed and was in good form. But from here, the attack bogged down. Every time Brody tried to go for the bomb, he was stifled by the magnificent efforts of one Mel Renfro, number 20. This brought up a fourth and five on the Cowboys' 40. Since eight minutes remain, Nolan went for three points instead of seven. But Gossett missed from the 47. And with the way Dallas could control the ball, Brody would not have many chances left. With seven minutes left to play and ahead by seven, Dallas did try to control the ball and the clock. But the 49er defense did not give in easily. And Mel Phillips' great individual effort set up a third and 11. Needing this first down badly, Landry called for a pass. And Morton hit Rucker on one of the best and biggest passes of his career to keep the drive going. On a repeat of this important play, we can see what happened to Morton. Caught between the devil and the deep blue sea, otherwise known as Hardman and Heinemann, Morton was hurt badly. But Craig Morton's career had been a history of injuries. Injuries with which he had played and played well. He came back two plays later and gamely tried to pass for another first down. But with his ribs and chest hurt, he was way off, and the Cowboys had to punt. Ron Whitby made sure Bruce Taylor didn't return his kick by putting it high into the ozone. Another bit of strategy executed flawlessly by Whitby and the bomb squad. So with four minutes left, Brody had another shot at the Cowboys. But after picking up one first down, he was dumped by Andre and Lilly for a nine-yard loss, setting up third and 19. The Cowboys were in a prevent, so Brody split the seams of the zone and hit Gene Washington, but was six yards short. It was now fourth and seven. Brody faded back and went short over the middle to his setback, but the pass was broken up and the 49ers had to give it up for the last time this season. This play, of course, deserves a repeat, if only because it was perhaps the biggest defensive play in Dallas 11-year history. It was fitting, then, that the pass be broken up by linebackers Edwards and Jordan. For the quick and aggressive cowboy backers are the heart of the Landry defense, and they have made the big plays all year. With two minutes to play, John Brody could only stand and watch as Dallas began to run down the clock. They ran it down to 17 seconds and smartly took a delay of the game penalty, but they couldn't run it out. So with five seconds left, John Brody had one last gasp for his team, his town, and his title. He tried valiantly, but time, the Grim Reaper, finally ran out on the San Francisco 49ers who must wait till next year. For the Dallas Cowboys, it was yet another chapter in their storybook climb to glory. And Coach Tom Landry, the much maligned head of his team, happily left Keysar Stadium knowing that he indeed had the last laugh at his critics, who said you can't win calling plays from the sidelines. Landry has found that by parlaying a tenacious defense with an unstoppable running attack, he could overcome any deficiency, while somehow keeping the emotional tenor of his team a confident winning one, one that has brought Dallas its first championship and one that could bring the Cowboys an even bigger trophy called the Super Bowl. If he can do it for one more game, Landry will have resurrected his team from its mid-season grave to become pro football's world champion, an impossible dream come true.